Good evening. Last chance this time to spend time in God's Word together. I'm thankful for that. It's, it's always pretty amazing, at least from my perspective, how uh, long you prepare for something and you, you set your mind and you work on things, both from a congregational standpoint and uh, from the preacher standpoint, to get to a series that's going to have seven lessons, as this one does, uh, when we're concluding tonight, and, and how quickly that's over. Uh, but it's been good for us. We're, we're glad to be here. I didn't get a nap this afternoon, but I did get a large handful of chocolate-covered espresso, espresso beans, and so uh, that probably is just as good. Uh, I'll, I'll try not to let that influence the speed with which I speak. Uh, try and slow that, make sure we keep that slow enough to be understandable. But good to be back with you again uh, this evening. It really has been a, uh, a good weekend for both Judy and me, and we are grateful for that. Very grateful to be able to meet and spend time with uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, it's, that's not something that we take for granted. Preachers have a pretty unusual opportunity in the sense that we get to meet a lot of our extended spiritual family that a lot of Christians don't get that opportunity with near that kind of regularity. And that's, that's very much appreciated on my part, uh, to be able to meet new brothers and sisters and spend time uh, with brothers and sisters and be able to establish uh, new relationships, renew and reacquaint old relationships, all of that. God has blessed us richly in giving us the spiritual family that he has given us. This morning we talked about Joshua and the decisions that Joshua made and the, the determination and the dedication that Joshua had as he wanted to move forward. Tonight's lesson really deals with the idea of how is it we're going to accomplish that. So once we have decided, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If that's the goal you have set, not only this morning, but even before this morning, then how are you going to accomplish that when uh, you have children and when you're raising children? Uh, how is it that we're going to be able to make sure that we are not spiritually barren with our children and the generations to come are not missing that which is needed, and that is faithful children of God? Uh, it's important for us to understand that you cannot, you cannot assume that your faith will be passed on. You just can't do that. It, it'd be nice if my parents, I mean, if my children just were faithful because I chose to be faithful and that was it, uh, but it's not going to typically work that way. It's going to require a good deal more effort than that, and we're going to find that you have to purposely pass on faith. It has to be something that you are thinking about with great intention. How do I help to pass on my faith and my belief and my understanding to my children, to the next generation? What effort am I going to put forth to make sure that that happens? It isn't just a matter of making sure that they're coming to service with me. It isn't a matter of just making sure that they see and experience certain things. I think there has to be great, great purposefulness, great intentionality if we're going to pass on our faith to our children. I want you to go back to Joshua chapter 24 again. Because Joshua, in the beginning of that chapter, he tells the people of Israel what God has done for them and how God has blessed them and how God has protected them and provided for them. And then he gets down to that part we talked about this morning where he challenges the people of Israel to serve God and to, to make a commitment. You remember in verse 15, he's saying, you can choose whoever, whoever you want, but he's saying you've got to make that choice. And he was encouraging them to choose God, the God of not only Israel, but the only God. He was trying to get them to make that choice and to be purposeful and put away the false gods so that they could serve Jehovah God. But then when you drop down just a little bit farther, I think it's interesting, and, and this is going to be a part of what we focus on this evening. But when you go back just a little further than what he said in those verses, it says in verse 26, and Joshua wrote the words, in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was in the sanctuary of the Lord. 
And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. And Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. So they're, they're going to now possess that land that God has given them. But before they did that, Joshua said, I need you to make a commitment I'm making mine. I need you to make a commitment that you're going to serve Jehovah God and that you will take on that responsibility. I think as you peruse the Old Testament especially uh, and you go through those things that God has said, one of the things that he makes absolutely clear is that he does not want his people to forget about him. And yet he says there's a real danger that that may happen. And he tells them there are going to come times when when your life is comfortable and things are good and things are moving well for you. And he says, that's, that's not always all that you might think that it is because it has a tendency to make us a little, a little independent as opposed to dependent. It makes us trust in ourselves a little bit and in the things that we have. And he says, I'm afraid that you're going to forget about me when that happens. And that, in fact, is exactly what happened with the people of Israel. Not just on one occasion, but on more than one occasion. We certainly understand that. And so what we find out is, if I shirk my responsibility, because God has given me a very specific responsibility in raising children. My, my goal and my, my job that God has given me is to launch those children from my house with a strong belief and a strong faith in God and a dedication to God that will allow them to take it to their friends, to their world that they become a part of and to pass it from generation to generation. But what we find is in Joshua, excuse me, in Judges chapter 2, when you shirk that responsibility, this is what happens. When, when somebody fails on that, because Joshua didn't, and even the elders that survived Joshua did not. They continued to build the faith of God or faith in God in the people of Israel. And so you read in chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, and Joshua dismissed the people of Israel, went each to his own inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. So it says, as long as Joshua was alive, people were still dedicated to God. They were serving the Lord. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And then it talks about Joshua dying, but then it says in verse 10, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor the things that he had done for Israel. That, that's a key. A, a, a generation that didn't know God nor did it know the things that God had done. For, that's two different things. He's saying there's a generation that rose that didn't have a relationship with God. It's important to know who God is, but he's not talking in that verse about who God is. He's saying these people didn't have a relationship. that They weren't truly people who felt that God was their God. They weren't people that were in constant communication with their God. These were people, you remember in Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus is talking, he said there's going to be some people who think they have a relationship with him and who are going to say, hey, we did mighty things in your name. We were doing all kinds of good works. And he says what? Depart from me, I never knew you. Did he not know who they were? Oh, he knew who they were. That wasn't the issue. They knew who he was. They were making claims about what they had done for him. What Jesus is saying is, we never had a relationship. Why? Because you were following your self-will. He says, it's those who do the will of my Father that I have a relationship with. They didn't have a relationship with him. The word no is used in the scriptures that way frequently. Even, even talking about a relationship between a husband and a wife. And he knew her. Well, of course he knew her. Well, that's not what it's saying. It's saying they had an, a relationship physically had a relationship. And that's what he's saying here. There arose this generation 
And that's what we're trying to avoid. This generation that neither had the relationship with God, and for some reason, they didn't even know all these incredible things that God had done. Is that hard to imagine? Hard to imagine that you are only now two generations from Joshua? Because remember, Joshua and Caleb were the only two of his generation that made it into the promised land. Only two of that whole generation. But the generation that followed him, that's who these elders are that are leading the nation now. That's the generation of Joshua's children. And he's saying, they served the Lord all the days of those people. But then there arose a generation that didn't even know what God had done. I don't know if you've ever thought about how incredible that concept is. Because they walked across the Jordan River on dry ground and it backed up for miles while they walked across. God had parted the Red Sea. You remember when, when the Israelites went in to conquer the different cities, the kinds of things, when, you remember when they went into Jericho and the spies went into Jericho, what Rahab said? We know who you are. We've heard the stories. We know what your God has done for you. The, the people of the land knew the great things that God had done, but now arose a generation of God's own people, and they didn't even know the great things that he had done. That's tragic. Not only to not have the relationship, but they didn't really even understand the things that he had done for them. How critical is that for us? And that's because God knows that when we're not careful and we become prosperous and things are going easy in our lives, that it is a natural proclivity to forget where the true blessings came from. He says that's a danger. We need to make sure our children are constantly reminded of who God is and what God has done. Look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, starting in verse 4, we read these words. We will not hide them, talking about God's works, from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set up their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but to keep his commandments. How critical is that process in making sure that we are not spiritually barren? Tim Kinzel, excuse me, Tim Kinzel, Tim Kinzel is a stepbrother of Judy's. Tim Kimmel has a quote, and that may be in your books there, where he says, this is in fact what success is, the conscientious stewarding of future generations. The conscientious stewarding of future generations. Uh, that is in fact important. Parents must expose God to their children through personal examples, vivid reminders. What is it that I'm going to do so that my children never, ever forget who he is and what he, in fact, has done? Parenting isn't always easy. It's challenging. But it may very well be one of the most worthwhile challenges that you can ever enter into because of knowing that it passes from generation to generation the idea of our God. Here's the key. You're going to have to be now what you want them to be later. That's critical. You will have to be now what you want them to be later because that's what they are looking at. I mentioned even Friday night, and I would tell you throughout life, Everything my sons ever learned, ever understood, ever thought about being a father or being a husband, and we only had sons, but if you have daughters, about being a wife or about being a mother, every single thing that they think about that will always be filtered first through what they saw in me or what they saw in their mother. That's critical. That's always where they're going to get their first impression. And so I need to spend my life being what he wants me to be, 
so that they can spend their life being what he wants them to be. I need to be now what they need, in fact, to be later. I like that picture. Doesn't have to be difficult. Mark Twain said, when your children are born, you should put them in a barrel, feed them through a hole in the barrel. He said, when they turn 16, plug the hole. (laughs) Not sure that's a good solution at all. But parenting isn't always as easy as what we might think that it is. I I love one mother who was talking to James Dobson, and he records it in one of his books about it. She said she she thought certain things about being a parent, being a mother, and all that goes with that. And, And she came home one day, and her three children and three of their friends were sitting in a circle in her living room. And she said they were giggling and playing, and she thought that was so cute. And and as she walked up behind them, she noticed something in the circle, and then as she got closer, she realized there were six baby skunks in the circle in her living room. She said she panicked, and she yelled, children, run. She said each child grabbed a skunk and ran. She said, it was at that moment that I understood motherhood is not everything that I thought it was going to be. I would tell you, there's a serious side of that as well. It's not all beautiful and glorious and, and easy. It's challenging sometimes. But if my job and my goal is to glorify God, even as we've just sung about, if that's my goal, I need to do whatever I can do to be the steward that God expects me to be, which just means that I am someone who carries out the dictates of somebody else. In other words, these children are mine for a time because God has given them to me to do something with them. Every gift that God provides us is that way, including children. You remember the parable of the talents? God said, these people got these different amounts, and when the master came back, what did he expect? You didn't just get those to have them. You got those in order to do something with them. That's that's the nature of stewardship, and that's who God says we are. And so when he says that children are a gift, a heritage from the Lord, God says, I have given you, for us, I've given you three wonderful gifts For what? Just so I can enjoy them? I mean, we did enjoy them. He says, that's not not the whole purpose. I give these to you so that you can use them to accomplish what I want you to accomplish with their lives. And that is to raise them to pass on to another generation the importance of glorifying our God. So just three points that I want to make in the lesson's yours. First, some faith must be caught it has to be caught in other words that's the idea of they need to see it they need to see it in me they need to understand do i passionately love jesus christ because if i don't passionately love my god i don't passionately love my lord why would i expect that they're going to have any passion toward him either He's not just saying I need to be a person who goes to services and attends worship with the saints. How how do they see me sing? How do they see me in regards to my reading? How how do they see me when when I'm praying? How passionate am I about my God? Isn't it interesting when you read some of the scriptures and, and authors like David in some of the Psalms even says things like, you're looking at the word and you think, Man, it's just like, it's like the most juicy morsel of the best meal. Have you ever gotten to a point to where you, you just, you look at some food, it's not quite time to eat, you know, your wife's preparing it, she's got it on the table, you just can't dig in yet, but you start salivating? It's like, man, that looks good. And you're just thinking, I can't wait to take the first bite of that. That looks so incredibly delicious. And he says, that's the way we ought to be viewing the word. Or, or like jewelry and more valuable than jewelry or gold or silver. He said, this means so much to me. Do my children see that kind of passion in me? Because if they don't see that kind of passion in me, how are they going to catch that from me? How are they going to learn that from me if they don't see that kind of passion in me? You want them to be good Bible students? Well, that's not going to happen unless what? 
Unless you're digging in the Word of God and they see you digging in the Word of God and you're opening the Word of God with them and you're going through the Word of God with them. And, uh, unless you're helping to make sure that they are in whatever opportunities are available to them to learn uh, about their God as they're developing that kind of passion. You want them to have a strong prayer life? Well, guess what? They need to see you praying. They need to understand that that means so much to you, to be able to talk to your God and express your most heartfelt feelings to your God so he can hear you. They, they need to hear you praying through those struggles of life even that go. You need to make sure that they have the ability to catch something from you because you already have it. If you don't have it, they can't catch it. And some faith must be caught. Our children need to see that kind of behavior in us. Are you generous? Do, do you so thankful, are you so thankful for the blessings that the Lord has given you that you're generous in, in how you give, not only how you give in a collective assembly like this uh, for a treasury, but how do you give in general? I love one little boy, he said, uh, the father was talking about, they're driving home. The father was complaining about the song leader was just slow. He wasn't really leading songs at the tempo it ought to be led. And he was griping about the song leading. And the mother was talking about the, the sermon droned on. And it, it just seemed like the guy was repeating points. And uh, they were making several complaints. And, and the boy sitting in the back seat says, yeah, but you've got to admit it was a pretty good show for a dollar. So what was he going to learn about contributing? You know, just what, what they see things that we don't think they see. And they're going to need to see faith, passionate faith, if they're going to have passionate faith, whatever it is that you want them to do. As your child's watching you, tell them a story. Tell them about God. It said they didn't know the things even that God had done. And so they need to see that in you, but not only see it, that there's some things that need to be taught. I need to sit down and tell them about my God. It, it, it boggles my mind that you could have this generation who was raised up and they didn't even know some of the incredible things that God had done. I can't imagine that you could be a part of a group of people that walked across the Jordan River on dry ground, that watched the walls of Jericho collapse before your eyes. Why? Because you, because you made some noise? And the walls collapsed because God did that for you? And you went in city after city and, and had these incredible victories by, by the name of God. How is it possible that all of that happens and you have a generation that's not telling their children about that? I mean, those are incredible stories, aren't they? To tell your children? He says, but they didn't because those people didn't even know what they had done. You need to make time to teach. Make time. You have to set that aside. You have to make sure that the children have an opportunity. And you need to let them know that that's so important to you that you are making that time. And you need to avoid some other commitments that you may have in order to accomplish the time that God wants you to do in that regard. But I would tell you, as important as that, you need to seek opportunities to teach. Look for the things around you. Wasn't it interesting how many times Jesus is just walking along and he looked and it's like, let me tell you a story about a fig tree. Let me tell you a story about a farmer who's casting seed. I'm thinking they saw a lot of those things, not, not only when he was saying it, but in, in daily lives. And he was just saying, hey, you know what? Here's a great opportunity. Look at this. Can't you get that picture when you read some of the, the statements in the Old Testament and things are said like, go to the ant. Have you ever just watched ants work? You ever watched them chew through a leaf and then carry a leaf that looks like it should take the, the whole strand of ants, but one ant's carrying this big leaf down and, and the effort they put forth and the way that they work? Isn't that a great opportunity? Maybe if you've got a small child and you're watching ants there at the house, you say, you know what? Let's talk about how fascinating that is and what we know about our God. Seeking opportunities that you can show them. It said Joshua set up a stone. Why? so they could tell stories. He says, your kids are going to ask, what is this about? That's the kind of thing God did. Set up memorials, put things up in the house. Uh, we need to do things so that the children can say, hey, what's that all about? 
In our house, we have a, because of one of our marriage retreats, we have a covenant renewal certificate because one of our marriage retreats, we had couples renew their vows that wanted to. And so we've got that hanging in there. And then on top of that, we've got a, a ribbon that has an old 1800s like skeleton key on it because one of our retreats, the entire series was about securing your marriage from outside influences, unlocking them to the inside influence of your spouse and God. And so it was all about securing your marriage. Well, that just hangs on that. It's interesting because people will walk into that living room and they look at that and they say, what's that all about? Well, let me tell you what that's about. And you get a chance to talk about it. That's the whole point of memorials. That's why God set them up. He said, and so you're going to have your children say, hey, dad, what's this about? Well, let me tell you about when we were slaves in Egypt. And that this is to tell you that God passed over us and protected us and brought us out of the land of Egypt. You remember when they crossed the Jordan, they all got those big stones? For what reason? He says, you're going to pile those stones up. You know, and that's, not, that's not a little rock pile. I'm thinking if you send down 12 men and say get a stone, it's almost like a challenge. Who's going to get the biggest stone? They're carrying big rocks up. And they're going to pile those stones up so that what? Children are going to say, Dad, what's that pile of rocks over there for? And you're going to say, let me tell you what my God did for us when he brought us across the Jordan River. You're looking for teachable moments, and they are all around us. There are so many opportunities just to share. It isn't just a matter of lecturing your children, of just granting your children the instruction straight from the word, though that's incredibly necessary. How does it apply to life? What can they learn as they look around them, the things that they see, the things that they hear every single day of their life? What can I do for them that will help them to understand what God has done for them? Share with your kids. Do you sit down with your kids and talk about what God's done for you? How important is that? I think one of the greatest things that parents can do, husbands and wives can do, share your love story with your kids. Tell them how you met. Tell them how you came to fall in love with one another and get married and the things that God has done for you. When, can you I would ask everybody here in your own mind, Shouldn't you be able to come up with lots of things that God has done for you in your life? Well, tell your kids about it. Specifically tell them. You know what? Let me tell you what God did for me. What God did for us. Let me tell you some of the great things that have happened in our life. Let me tell you about people that God has brought into our life that have been life-changing for us. Helping your children to understand that. Those are the teachable moments sharing those stories with them. What about the prayers that God has answered for me? Establish those memorials yourself. Put things up in the house. Put things on the TV set. Put things on the refrigerator, whatever the case may be. Set up memorials. Why? So your kids can say, hey, Dad, what's this about? Well, let me tell you what that's about. I just want to remember that this is what God has done for me. It's just a reminder all about what God has done. And I share that because I want my kids to not only know God, but to know what God has done. So it needs not only to be caught because I'm living it, it needs to be taught so that they can have me share my God with them. Which brings us to the final, which is the more critical point of the three. And that is, some faith, or true faith, must be sought. This is critical. I can talk about God all I want to. I, I can show them God and what he has done for me. But at some point, I need to help them understand that my God needs to become their God. My faith can't sustain them, cannot. My children cannot serve God for a lifetime on my faith. I understand that's whose faith they're dealing with when they're young. They don't necessarily have a faith of their own yet. But I'm trying to get them to a point where God is their God and they have a relationship and they have their faith 
Their strength doesn't come from who I am or what I am doing. Their strength comes from the fact that they now have a relationship with God that can provide them the same strength that my relationship with God can provide me. There's a sense in which faith is childlike. I understand that. But there's a sense in which faith is very grown up as well. And it comes with a cost. And I don't want to just try and pass on my faith to my children so that when the cost is demanded to them and the challenge comes to them, that their faith collapses. Because it was my faith, not theirs. They need to have their faith. And to do that, I need to show them a desirable God. Not just a God that they must serve, but a God that they should want to serve. A God that they should love I want them to not only believe God, I want them to fall in love with God and serve God because they realize how incredibly fantastic God is. What an awesome God we serve. And if I'm presenting them a God that is less than desirable, it's not likely they're going to be real strongly interested in that God. But God talks about that. God would have us to love him. You remember Jesus even talking about, it, you, you'll follow my commandments, but based on what? If you love me. I mean, he loves us. We understand that. He gave his life for us. But he wants us to love him back and keep those commandments. Why? Because I understand what an incredible God it is that I serve. And so we have that faith stimulated you can't trick your kids into faith. It's not a matter of saying a few magic words. It's not a matter of only being brought down into the water and brought back up out of the water. It's not a few prayers. It's not attending services. All those things are important. All those things are important. But those things in and of themselves will not overcome the challenges to faith that we must all face in this world. It takes a relationship with God, a God that you know, a God that you love, and it has to be their faith. I can tell you as a parent, and I know other parents experience the same thing, it is an incredible feeling when one of your children, when they're an adult, calls you to tell you something exciting about God in their life. As you watch them develop their faith and fall in love with God the same as you have. That, that's just a, that's a blessed event when you can see your children who have that kind of desire to follow God because he is, in fact, a desirable God. It's important. Does God tell us things that we shouldn't do? Yes. But if you spend your life only telling your children the things that God says they can't do, they're going to grow up with a God that is a very negative God. And I would tell you, Christianity is not based on what we don't do. Don't get me wrong. There are things that we don't do because God tells us. Christianity is based on what we do and who we are and the way that we live from a positive standpoint. And our kids need to see that and understand that in God. Josh McDowell wrote a book, Evidence Demands a Verdict. I know a lot of people have read that one probably. But he wrote a version of that for teenagers too. And I always loved the chapter title of one of his chapters. I think it was either chapter one or two. It's called God, the Cosmic Killjoy. The book's called Don't Check Your Brains at the Door. Love the title of the book too. But it's called God, the Cosmic Killjoy. Because a lot of kids grow up thinking that's who God is, just there to negate what they can do in life and that's not who God is does God give us things to keep us pure and holy and tell us to avoid and stay away from absolutely but God is about who we become and he wants us to see that he is a good loving kind God who only does and says things because he wants the absolute best for all of his people. And so I need to help my children have their own faith and fall in God, fall in love with my God the same way I did, so that he becomes their God, their faith. If we're not careful, sometimes we push our kids maybe even a little bit too hard 
I would just tell you, we need sometimes just to make sure we're telling the story. We sing a song. I love to tell the story. That's who we need to be. I love to tell the story. Sit that child down and say, let me tell you again. I'm just going to tell you the story. Because the story itself will change people's hearts when they see God for who he truly is. They need to have their own faith. And it's my job to remove them from my faith to their faith. And you need to do that, understanding that there's some of that they're going to have to be uh, catching. It's caught. Some is taught. But most importantly, I want to make sure that it is sought. I want my kids seeking God the way that he would want them to seek him. If you're not a Christian, nothing more important in the world, nothing more important in the world than giving your life to God, making sure that God, in fact, is your God as well. He wants you to do that because you know who he is and because you know what he's done. And the greatest of the things that he's done is send his own son down to this earth to give up his life so I could live. Is that not an incredible gift beyond imagination? Remember, somebody acknowledge. Is that not an incredible gift? God sent his son. Sent his son to die for me. Wow, unimaginable. And yet he did it so that I could have a lifetime here and an eternal relationship with him when this life is over. I am grateful to my God for that. And so I gave my life to him. If you want to give your life to him tonight, we'd love to help you do that. If you don't understand what that means, talk to us. We'd love from his word to show you what he asks of you to do to start that relationship with him. For those of us that are Christians, may we understand this battle, our marriages are important. Our, our homes, while they're intact, are important. But so are our children when they're out of our home. Are we preparing them to have their own faith so that we don't raise that generation that knew not God nor the things that he had done.